Excited? Yes. Is God good this morning? Yes. Huh? Yes. Wow. <coughs> Amazing. Are we saved? Yes. yes. Right? Jesus is coming back. Yes. Right? Ah, we'll meet him in the clouds, right? We'll be in heaven. Yes. That's amazing. It's exciting to uh, be in this plan, right? It's ex exciting to have a Bible, right? Wow. Otherwise, you, you, you read Times of India on Sunday morning. <laughs> so, okay, First Corinthians 10, verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Have you ever fallen in trouble? Hmm? Any trouble fit people here? <coughs> this is the worst for us, okay? If you are in trouble. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Did you read that? It's in the Bible, right? This says that any trouble you ever fell into, God will not allow it until you are able. Right? Like He sends the provision before the problem. Okay? Like the problem which you ever come across in your life, you already have the provision for it. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I've, I've Every time I read this verse, I still ask the question. Fourteen years later, what's the way of escape? <laughs> because when you are in something like that, a lot of times, the hardest things, thing to find is the way of escape, right? And you say, where is it? Right? And, uh, but it says, he has prepared a way of escape, right? One more verse and we'll sit. Like, you will sit. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> For this one. Verse 28. As much as I have to trust God for the message, I have to trust God for the joke. <laughs> because pastors can be sometimes really boring people. <laughs> I had same feelings early in my Christian life. <laughs> I thought they are made of another material <laughs> until you get ordained and you realize it's all the same, you know? Okay. Verse 28, verse 1. I'm not offended, by the way. I thought I have to use something this morning, right? Verse um, 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursue it. But the righteous are bold as a lion. 
What are you? What are we? Righteous, right? We are like this is the um, the words about unsaved and saved in a way, or the carnal and spiritual. And uh, it says we are bold like lion. Father, this morning we just uh, trust the anointing in the church, and um, we are not able, but we are able in Christ. And uh, we pray that you give us something to uh, chew and something to be nourished in. And uh, more than us, you are ready. Anoint us this morning. Prepare, prepare us to hear, really, really hear deeply in our spirits. We give this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, today I was reading something and uh, I don't know where it was, but uh, the guy was talking about the oldest written document available on the face of the earth. And it's in some museum somewhere in Europe. And uh, unknown writing from thousands of years back. And uh, it says, these days have become evil. And children have become more disobedient than ever before. And think of this. Like, it's writing on behalf of a society or a generation. But have you ever said in your heart, I used to be better off? Like those days were better. And uh, I think that's how, in general, the humanity thinks. Like times past were better. And today there is a problem. Right? Was it only I identified with that? <laughs> Do you think that's kind of a story which we face? And the reason for that thing is that this world is decaying. To Adam, God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then dying you will die. Right? So the death does not come in one shot, in a way. Like he died spiritually on the day he ate of the fruit and he kept on dying for 900 plus years. And he finally physically died 900 years later. Dying you shall die. Every day there is a reduction. We may increase maybe financially and increase in our age, but there is a reduction going on. And man is troubled at that. We fear that. That's why death in the, in the world outside, if, if we don't get saved, the death has a scream. It's nasty, it's fearful, it's dangerous. People don't like talking about it. You get into a conversation of the gospel, you say, God loves you, that's fine. But you talk about you are going to die. And they say, come on, what are you, what are you talking? And then they cover up. And then they make statements like this. Who cares? But brother, you really care. But you, you're saying this to pretend. I'm going to consider this verse which we read this morning. Uh, God allows death in our lives. 
And the nature of the test itself is it's going to be tough. Right? If it wasn't tough, then it won't fall in the category of the test, right? If I could, so, so in, a, in a way I am able, but if my ability was higher than the test itself, then it should be a cakewalk, right? But it doesn't look like a cakewalk, and if it looked like a cakewalk, then it would not categorize as a test. So that ability which God has given me has to be underneath. It cannot be so obvious for the test to remain a test. Right? So that's why there is a like, big seeming contradiction in experience when we look at that verse and we say, where is my ability to bear that load? You say, was it like, yes, theoretically I know the word of God is true, but when I read this verse and when I look at my life and I say, oh my God, in my case, somehow there seems to be a mismatch. <laughs> right? And the thing is, for the test to remain a test, that ability needs to be hidden. Right? The way of escape cannot be so obvious, because if the way of escape was obvious, then somehow that temptation will not remain a temptation. Right? That's amazing. But God is, so I want you to look at the context of that verse. We'll go back. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, uh, verse 1 itself. And let's look at what story is God using to explain us that reality. And this is the story from Exodus. Exodus 14. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is Exodus 14. Remember children of Israel under Moses and they are running from Egypt and Pharaoh changes his mind and he is pursuing and coming behind is Pharaoh's army and right in front is the Red Sea. And this is amazing. They are crying. What, what now, right? What is going to happen now? He says, remember, brethren, this is what happened. And they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I'll come back to this later in the message. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. We are in a local assembly today. And thank God He has given us a church. And I know it's the same way for uh, most of you. But I would still say it. You know, I, I cherish my church. Like, earthly speaking, it is possibly one of the greatest things going on in my life. I have a visiting card in my pocket. And I, there is a company's name written there and a designation written there. But you know what? The day I die, this visiting card will not matter. But the church which I attend will matter on the day of my death. It will matter at the Bhima seat. And it's amazing. They were baptized under Moses. And they were drink, eating the same spiritual food and they were drinking the same spiritual drink. And that's, that's somehow that's connected with the victory. I don't understand it fully. Will going to a certain church make me victorious? I can't make that formula. But I know. I know that choice is an important choice. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent 
we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters. I'll comment on this word. I've been preaching a series on the nature of God. Who is God? Remember Matthew 16 when Jesus asked the disciples, what do people say who I am? Somebody says a prophet, somebody says Elijah, somebody says a good teacher, whatever. And who do you say? And G Peter replies, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, oh wow! Like, those words are not in the Bible. <laughs> Holy Spirit came, like told me. <laughs> Jesus said, wow! Peter, amazing! Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I, I said, come on. Bring it here. If Jesus was here today, and he stood here at the pulpit and asked, who do you say I am? 99% of the crowd is going to give the same answer, right? What's so big deal about that answer? What's so big deal about that answer? Like Jesus is the Christ and he's the son of the living God. Like, oh, if you are church going, if you have been discipled, if you have been reading your Bible, you should know that. So what, what's so impressive about that answer? You know what? Our Christian life is not about our vocabulary. There is something about Peter's answer. It's a deep reality in his heart. The nature of God is misinterpreted in this world. We, sitting in the church, reading our Bibles, we Christians can be guilty of forming a second-hand opinion about God. Right? But, but Christianity is not a religion it's a relationship with God himself. And God, does not, God doesn't have grandchildren, right? Like he, he is looking for a personal relationship with me. He's looking to me to speak to me personally. And Christianity is the only faith where God is speaking. It's not only in the book, right? There are many religions which would have the book. But Christianity is the only faith where God is talking to his people. And he wants to talk to me. And when he talks to me, and when I listen, and when that thing goes into my spirit, that's amazing. That's what impresses God. And every such thing, he says, wow. He says, amazing. Because it's from him. My ideas about God cannot impress God. But God's ideas about himself imparted to me through revelation in my human spirit are going to be applauded by heaven. And that's what this world needs to see. That's what evangelism's intention is. It's not just quoting John 3.16. Like, do people see God? Like, I can know, like, in theology we, we talk about attributes of God, right? What's idolatry? Were, Egypt, were Jews at that moment involved in idolatry? I didn't think long enough to actually answer that question at this moment. But sometimes idolatry may not be physical, you know, bringing in the statues in my house and worshipping them. Man is able to worship concepts. His own concepts about God. A small God than who he really is. And you can, we can take all the attributes of God and then selectively 
exclude some of them in my view of God and that makes it idolatry. Somebody who is God, like, you know, this is how, like, how to define God. Like, if you reduce God even a little from what He is, then He is no more God. Either He is fully God or He is no God. So that why, that's why in, in theology we say God is simple. Why is He simple? Because you cannot break Him apart into pieces. You cannot take one attribute of Him and put it aside or, or maybe say this is not such a relevant attribute. And that's not how God is. He is who He is completely. And I can't know Him unless the Spirit of God reveals Him to me. And He does. He wants me to get to know Him. So He says, verse 7, Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them. This is being written to the church, by the way. Right? As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 320,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. And then he says, so here is the context. Here were these people. They came up to Red Sea, and here are they crying, and God does something amazing. God says, Moses, be still and know the salvation. And then the Red Sea divides it into two. They pass over, they see their enemies destroyed. Right? You know the story. And this is what, this was a big problem. This was huge, and the miracle was huge. And Israel remembered it throughout their history. Go back to Psalm 77, and there this incident is quoted. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. This is a man with a problem. Verse 3. I remembered God and was troubled. That's, that's the problem verse. Right? I remembered God. Like, normally, if you are in the church, you will not say this. You will say, I remembered God and I rejoiced. I remembered God and I worshipped. I remembered God and I prayed. I remembered God and remembered my blessing. But this man said, I remembered God and was troubled. What is the intent of the testings which are allowed into my life? Where, which is the way of escape which my temptation is designed to lead me to? This man I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You know, I was reading one theologian recently and uh, he was talking about the omniscience of God. 
omniscience means God knows everything. Is I'm never alone, right? Then we go out during our week, we are never alone. There is no aspect of our life which is hidden from God. And he, say, he says, omniscience can have two kinds of responses from people. Right? What is the first response? Somebody will say, oh my God. God, God knows everything. Let's go and Like, what did Adam and Eve do with the omniscience of God in Genesis chapter 3? Let's go and run and hide behind the bush. But that's illogical. God knows where are you. Right? He's, he says, where are you, Adam? But before he is asking, he's, he's actually maybe, like, like if you look at the picture, God comes in the garden and Adam is hiding in the bush there, right? And God is not looking here and saying, Adam, where are you? God is actually looking, Adam, where are you? <laughs> like, and he's smiling at him. Like, I know. So the man who does not understand the nature of God, omniscience will be scary to him. And you'll say, oh my God, like, how, how, how do I run from you? Psalm 139, remember? What does David say? Where shall I run from your spirit? I think he starts very, in a very interesting way. He has a good theology, but he also has a problem. Where shall I run from your spirit? Right? But then he, he, he his thought process, he's thinking with Christ. And he... he he ends the psalm like this. Search me, O Lord. Wow. So, one, the other response towards the omniscience of God is, God, because you know me, and because you know everything about me, and because there is an added information, because knowing all about me, knowing everything, all those things which even I loathe about myself. Still Christ died on the cross. Thinking of me. Thinking of my salvation. He, he loves me. Now omniscience added with love says, Lord, search me. Come on, Lord. Here is the book. Here is my life. And all these pages are known to you, but no problem, you, you go over them again. Because you love me. So Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. And I, I always thought that is talking about they were not ashamed of each other. I never realized that it could also mean that they were not ashamed before God. And so, so they could like in the eyes of omniscience, they could stand naked and not be ashamed and say, it's okay, God loves me. But after the fall, it was not okay. Now we need the fig leaves, right? And that's, the whole idea is the twisted understanding of God, a short understanding of God. Something starts missing from the picture. And the temptation, by the way, Satan is involved our flesh is involved, the nature of the environment in which we live is involved, and, and somehow the temptation gives me an impetus that I should subtract something from my idea of God. And often that is the goodness. I am in this situation because God is good. How about that? But it doesn't look like. But God is a good God. Can he, be, can he be against me ever? No, he cannot. What if I'm living in poverty today? What if, what if my... Like, please don't use credit cards so much. It's not a good habit. But what if my credit card bills are bulging and it seems like I'm unable to pay them? God is good. 
in those credit card bills. I, I heard of a man, why I'm saying this is I heard of a man. I never realized those kind of problems exist. I kind of, I've lived in those kind of problems years back. And uh, I just almost forgot that those, those things happen. I pay my credit card bills right on the due date. Like I just, one time it happened re like few months back and I, I was like 300 rupees interest. Come on. But you know this guy, somebody told me, he was ready to commit suicide along with his family, a software engineer. Oops. Because the credit card bill, I don't know how high they are. But I'm saying in the middle of those kind of situations, God is good. Doesn't look like it almost seems like I can say, yes, God is great, God is powerful, God has all knowledge, God is magnificent, everything is there, but like deep within me, I'm not so sure. The temptation might have brought me to a point that I don't see that, that way. And I say, I don't know whether God is kind of, he, does he like me? Does he really love me? Have you, has anybody ever, like, I've, I've heard Christians like, I don't like that kind of thinking, by the way. I've been in problems, by the way. I'm, I'm not preaching here like, I've had, like, somebody say, why did I land up here? Is something in my life at which God is upset? <laughs> you thought of that? This way? No, I, it's funny. Why would I think like that? That's not the way. It's not who God is. And it's my small thinking about God which is saying that. God is a good God. He's for me. He's, he's not going to be against me and I'm not in trouble today because God doesn't test us like that. You know the difference? There are two words in our Bible sometimes used interchangeably. Like the word temptation and the word test. Right? And what is the difference? Even Greek language has two words. Dokimazo. Dokimazo means testing with an intent of promotion. It's, it's almost like, why do you put gold into fire? Do you want to destroy the gold? No. How would you stamp it is a 24 carat? The only way to stamp it is a 24 carat is, is by putting it through the test. So when, when God puts us in test, and it may be the same situation, but some, from Satan's viewpoint it is a temptation. And he's kind of alluring me to come out of the place where I'm designed to be. So Satan allures me to come here and I almost go up to that point and I say, oh, what a filthy rag I am. But you know what? God is, God, from God's perspective, it is Doki Mazo. He's saying, you know what? I want to put a stamp on you. I'm a good God. And if it wasn't that I hid that capacity in you, which you are, which you are already able, then maybe it would not be the testing and maybe I could not put the stamp. So in a way I have hidden it. It is not so obvious and maybe you will have to walk with me for a while to see what I have made you to be. So here in this psalm, you can read the psalm. This man is like, he's talking like at a ground level, the way we, in the situations we can be. He's, but he remembers, he says, Verse 8, he says, is his mercy gone forever? He is questioning like, oh, is, like, has God forgotten to be merciful? Verse 9, he says, has God forgotten to be gracious? But verse 10, he says, and I said, this is my infirmity. What is my infirmity? 
my infirmity is that somehow I don't have the full picture at the moment. And it's human. It's human. I was listening to one uh, ABD class this week on Friday morning. And, and uh, you know, Paul says in Romans 7, 18, he says, In my flesh dwells no good thing. So in everybody, right from that corner, Hudson, right, Hudson, hi, <laughs> right from that corner, Hudson, and all the way here, and everybody, you know, Romans 7 and 18 applies to all of us, do you know that? In my flesh dwells no good thing. So, so, so basically, Dr. Stephen said in that message, he says, when a brother offends you or he disappoints you when he, somebody does something wrong you can say in your heart he is human no surprises right he is human and God says so and he, he, he actually gave an incident in that class he says, uh, the famous preacher John Rice one time he was in the pulpit and he was kind of exhorting the congregation and one lady was sitting there and she was kind of little bend. So he thought she's lacking attention. So he says, come on, you lady, you get straight. You know, like a typical Baptist preacher. And he was like, and, and this lady was like kind of saying, no, like, no. And, and he got upset and he said, ushers, take her out. And, and this doesn't happen in greater days, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Otherwise, I would be out many times. <laughs> For many things. <laughs> yeah. but our pastor is amazing, right? <laughs> He's been such an example of grace. So, when, when that lady stood up for being taken out, it turns out that she had a hunchback. And uh, John Rice was convicted in his heart. And after the service, he went to that lady and said, Sister, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you had that problem. I'm really sorry. You know, this lady looked at him, him eye to eye. He says, Pastor Rice, I know you are human. I know you are human. And I think that's an amazing understanding. And this man is human. And he says, I know my infirmity. I know I don't have the full picture at the moment. I only know this much about God. And this much is good enough in a way, but I want to grow in my understanding of Him. And as I grow in my understanding of Him, I will really, really, really understand how much He loves me. I will really, really, really understand how good He is. This is that verse in Proverbs. It says, what happens? The wicked pursues when no one, like the wicked runs when no one pursues. What does that mean? Little, like, I don't know, like you watch horror movies. <laughs> Bad example. I'm sorry, I don't prepare my illustrations. I only read my verses. <laughs> That's a bad practice. <laughs> Sometimes. Not always. So you can become a preacher. Some of you guys who are thinking, start a Bible study soon, somewhere. You can preach, really. If you have done a couple of years of Bible college, just go for it. Ask one team member. And you can preach. If Pastor Devendra can preach, you can preach. I'm telling you. Really. So, you know what happens in those horror movies? Shh! <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing happened. Well, some noise came and you were scared, right? I don't know from where the danger could come. Right? People have a habit of making up trouble in their mind. Why can't 
Why can't I live joyfully? Why can't I say it's an amazing life? Why can't I say let's go out and do something? Why do we sometimes get very inward? It doesn't help. The solution of my problem often doesn't lie in looking at myself. If people very close to you trouble you too much, go and stand on the street and preach the gospel. I'm telling you, if you have, like really, the day I feel very not so satisfied with my team, I go a little far from everybody and take some bunch of tracks and come on, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Somebody will get with a, on a conversation with me. I mean, that's better, right? Rather than sitting there thinking, he should have respected me that much. Come on. Come on. Go and preach the gospel. That's really the good news. Right? This man says in Psalm 77, I'll meditate on your work. And then verse 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And then verse 19, this is the verse. Your way is in the sea, and your path is in the great waters, and your footsteps are not known. You know what he is meditating on? He's thinking of that Red Sea crossing. And he says, you know what? Until these guys were on this side, they never understood that path which they are going to walk through. They never understood it. But when the waters parted, there were footprints on that path. But God knew it all the time. And God, your ways are not known. And verse 20, you lead your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. You know, this is the idea about the way of escape being hidden. I don't see it, but I trust that God is good. And I wait upon him. And I, you know, where do I run? Where do I run? Pastor Doug preached uh, during the rap in the convention. And I, I never got to hear it until this week. And I was listening to some convention messages. I wanted to catch up on recovering my money. <laughs> you know? Like, all expenditure, you know. I, I'm a very miser. You know. That's why I am. It's great. I, I became a Christian. I'm making best of my investment. You know, I want to be preaching the gospel. Like, it's, a, it's a very selfish guy, you know. And, and trust me, if you are like me, this is the thing you do. Respond to the call of God in your life. That's... That's a smart thing to do. That's great investment. You have greatest returns. So Pastor Doug preached this message on the life of Joseph. You remember Joseph was in the prison? And Genesis 39 to 41. And uh, Joseph has two, two prison partners. Right? The chief butler and chief baker. And these guys have a dream and Joseph interprets the dream. And you made a great case as you, I, I love the way you painted the picture in that devotion, you know. And uh, so this guy, he has the dream and Joseph has the answer and Joseph gives him the answer. Three days later you will be released, right? And he says, my goodness, I've been praying all these years for my, you know, for like being released from the prison and my time has come. Praise the Lord, right? And, and he, when Butler is being released, he says, remember me, okay? <laughs> remember me, right? And what happens? Come on, 
He's having a party at home. Who is Joseph? He doesn't like, forgot, two more years. And Pastor Doug said in that message, you know what? Joseph could have said, why two years, Lord? And what if he got released when Butler, if Butler remembered? The famine would have come. Joseph would have gone back to his home, to his father and brothers. They would have had great homecoming. And two years later, the famine would have come. And they would have died, all family together. <laughs> 13 graves or 70 graves, whatever. But God allowed that two additional years of prison. Because in that day, in the plan of God, Joseph will be the man who will display the wisdom and the glory of God and save the whole world. Right? And the, the dream of Pharaoh itself is amazing. Seven years of famine are preceded by seven years of prosperity. The, the provision comes before the test comes. That's the goodness of God. And an average person in Egypt might not have seen it. But Joseph saw it. Right? And you and I as believers are being trained in our life to see the provision before the problem comes. And trust me, it's tough, right? We have been in those situations. But I've also seen Christians and we feel so inspired when you meet people like that. You see, wow, wow, somehow they know, somehow they know, against all sight evaluations, that God is good. And there is a way of escape. There is something going on which we don't understand fully, but God is good. And there are footsteps under the sea waves. And I'll be walking over them. That's amazing. We worship the Lord in those kind of situations. We say, you are so, you are amazing. And not just that, you love me. Like this, you are amazing and you love me. Become a great music. That's the real worship. The second place I learned to go to is this place, the body of Christ. It is amazing because the way the body functions is almost footprints under the sea. We don't understand it. Come on. A lot of you may be only here for one and a half hours on a Sunday morning and then go back and you will come back next Sunday, hopefully. If you are an alternate week Christian, I admire you <laughs> because I really don't understand how you survive. I'm not as strong as you are. <laughs> you know, I'm not mocking, please. But I really, I don't understand. This is, I, I need church five times in a week. Maybe seven times in a week. Maybe 14 times in a week. You know? I need my church. They were baptized with Moses. They were getting, eating same spiritual food. They were nourished. They were eating same spiritual drink. That's amazing. Why did God refer to that? Is it not connected with 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Is it not connected with way of escape? I don't believe so. I've been taught to read my Bible in context. I believe body of Christ has a great role to play. I can't live a lone ranger Christianity. 
I want to be together. Last portion to to just uh, show you this application, John chapter 11. You know, this is the story of Lazarus in the tomb. He's died, right? And Jesus is going to perform this amazing miracle. Oops. When the a man is being made alive, and um, there are some intentional moves by Jesus in that chapter. One of them you know, right? He waited four days. That was an intentional move on, on him, on his part. <coughs> he could have come earlier, right? Mar Martha complained it. He came late. This is what happens in the test. He seems to come a little late. Purposefully. The boundaries seem to be a little bigger than where they should have been. All right. That's the way God does it. That's the way I get an opportunity to exercise faith. When I don't see anything, I trust His nature and character. My definition of God does not change. When my emotions say that maybe I should change them, I say, no. God is, Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today and forever. Just because my situation has changed today, He hasn't changed. There's something there's something. Like how, how, how does a child, like dad and child, that relationship and sometimes like, like child, child has this have way of looking at the dad. Says dad is up to something. Right? He is, no, like two children talking and they say, no, no, no. The dad forgot my birthday. No, 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 no. He hasn't forgotten. He must be planning a surprise. Right? And I think that's the way we can look at God and say, say, oh, four days late. Must be something in his mind. Something greater than what I can even expect. And then he comes. And here is like he, Lazarus come forth, right? That statement. And I want to think of that moment. Lazarus is inside, he's tied with the burial clothes, his face is still wrapped with the napkin and the stone is still on, on top of the grave, right? And here is Jesus and he says, In verse, where is it? Um, verse 39, Jesus says, Take you away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Verse 41, Then, they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. I was, I was asking this question, who are the they? This must be a crowd. Pharisees, Sadducees, religious people, disciples of Jesus, you know, onlookers. And Jesus, like Lazarus is alive inside. And Jesus had ability to perform the miracle this way. Lazarus vaporized from inside and come and stand outside. 
It would have happened, right? Or Jesus could have said, stone, get rolled out. No. You know what he did? He says, okay. Bringing from dead to alive, I will do. There, I need volunteers. This is amazing. Jesus needs volunteers. And guess who they are? Right. I need someone to roll the stone. I need, in my life, I have God. But who will roll the stone? That's where I go. In the body of Christ, there are people who are rolling the stones for my lives. Unknowingly, I don't even understand it. Have you ever been in a bad mood and happened to come to church and one hour later when you are leaving, you walked half a kilometer, happy, joyful, and then realized, hey, when I came, I was having a rough day. It's nowhere. This is amazing. This is the mystery of the body. And that's the place where miracles happen. Deep things at the inside. And then he later in this he also says, his hand, verse 44, he says, He that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Lose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believe on him. So this is what happens. Lot of unwrapping. Lot of stone removals. Lot of breath of fresh air. I don't want to be one of those who says, hey, there must be a stench there. Let's not touch them. And this is amazing. In a healthy body of Christ, nobody cares about your stench. This is amazing. We have these hands. These are gifts of God. These are given to roll the stones. You know that? And trust me, when Jesus says roll the stones, there is nothing better than to roll the stones. That's why we, we are here. We enjoy our church. We trust God. We come here when we are going through our greatest stuff. You know, the biggest things. Nobody knows. And nobody in a way cares. Like I'm saying in, the, in that way. Like nobody is suspicious. Nobody is looking. Nobody is trying to figure out my story. Nobody is trying to figure out what's going on at the back. Because it is Jesus who is going to bring the dead to life. And all I do, I somehow find opportunities in my life as one of the members in the body of Christ. That Jesus will some, sometime tell me, okay, unwrap it. Hey, here is something, little unwrap it. And I do it. And then another one. And then another one. And I am getting unwrapped. And my stones are being rolled. And this is amazing. That's a great place. That's, a, that's such an amazing way of escape. I love it. You know, <clears throat> we are so privileged that we have, we are on the move. Right? Looking at Bhutan, going to the mission, like, I wish, I, I feel so tempted. <laughs> I should be with all the visits which Pastor Atul does. 
My boss will get crazy. Uh, it's amazing. I'm not running at every funny sound which comes around in my life. Right? The, the wicked flees when no one pursues. We are not those kinds. Satan can make noises. World can make noises. My flesh can make noises. Your flesh can make noises. I'm not running. What are we like? Those are noises. Come on. That stench. I don't see that stench. I'm waiting to hear that voice roll the stone. He will deal with the stench. I have something better to do. I'm, be, I'm going to be serving God. I'm baptized with Moses. Right? I'm, I'm one with this body. This church is my home. Right? God has a calling. And I have, like, we are winning souls. And we are going to be planting churches. And I have my portion. And let them make, keep making noises and let them keep smelling. But I am here. And I am looking for that voice. And this, the, I thought he will come in two days. Maybe he will come in three days. Maybe he will come in four days. Maybe he will come in seven days. Who cares? That's his problem. My task is to roll the stone. Right? He will do what he does. And he's ready to do that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word, your encouragement, your grace, your mercy, your goodness. It's so misunderstood by us, by also your people, as much as in the world. And help us and teach us and reveal to us more and more. Because outside the pulpit, outside the church, deep within our soul, in those moments when the enemy kind of surrounds us, that we should not question your goodness. Rather than Teach us to worship and teach us to draw to the body. And teach us to take our place like a lion. Thank you, Lord. Anybody here, if you haven't received salvation in your life, if you haven't received Christ personally, there is a moment to do that. He promises to forgive all your sins. He died for every human being on the cross. Includes you. And it's your turn to believe in Him and receive this salvation as a free gift. And if you are ready, then pray this prayer meaningfully in your heart. God is listening. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for loving me. And if you are that one who is praying that prayer for the first time in your life, then I want to rejoice in your salvation. Can you lift your hand for a moment and put it down? If you prayed that prayer for the first time in your life, thank you. Anybody else in this room prayed that prayer for the first time? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.